How's it going, everybody, and welcome back to the On Deck Podcast. I am super excited about today's episode because I get to sit down with you guys and share my story. I get questions all the time on social media asking me how I got to where I am today and what decisions I made and, of course, mistakes I made to get to where I am in the outdoor media space. It is a fun journey, and I'm so excited to share it all with you guys. My name is Tyler, and welcome to On Deck. Well, well, everybody, welcome back to the TRF On Deck Podcast. My name is Tyler Anderson. If we have not had the chance of meeting before, whether online or in person, I just love using my gifts of videography and storytelling to interview people on this podcast and and find out what their gifts are and how they are using those gifts for good. And so I'm just excited to hop into this episode with you guys and share my story. We're going to talk about everything from my, my growing up to you know, the first ever YouTube video that I made and kind of my thoughts around YouTube as a whole and then going into where I see myself in 5, 10, 40 years from now in the, the marketing you know YouTube video freelance sort of space. I have a ton of passions and a ton of things that I'm excited for you guys to hear about. And so if you enjoy watching my instructional videos, this might be a little bit of a, a diversion from that, but I think watching this and you know just let it play as you work on your dishes or put your kids to bed, that kind of thing. I just want you guys to be able to hear my story and know more about me as a creator and that I'm not just putting on a show for the cameras. This is exactly who I am. And uh, in this podcast, you're going to learn exactly who I am. Now, a few uh, bookkeeping things to take care of here at the beginning. This is the On Deck Podcast, usually only found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you can stream and listen to podcasts. The video version that everybody is actually watching right now is usually only found, uh, with, with me and my guests talking, the video version is usually only found on my private YouTube subscription. So if you're on desktop and you go next to the subscribe button, there's a button that says join. And for $1.99 a month, which is the cheapest I could possibly make it for you guys, I'm not trying to bankrupt anybody, and I'm not also not trying to make a whole bunch of money off of this, but it is my way for you guys to get even more involved in the TRF brand, and so if you guys want to uh, be, become a part of that, you guys can get all of the uh, the extra video content on my channel, which includes the On Deck podcast video version. I just felt like this one was important to... Uh, open up to everybody and not just put it behind the paywall. I, I think telling my story is going to benefit uh, the you know interactions between you guys and myself as the audience and the creator. And so I just am really excited for you guys to hear this. But we're going to talk about a whole bunch of topics today, one of them being sponsors, you know, both in and out of the of the fishing, hunting industry. Everybody wants to work with companies and, and learn about what sponsorships look like and what it takes to get them. And I have a ton of experience and in, in my experience, a lot of wisdom uh, when it comes to that topic. And so we are going to start off this podcast with a sponsor, which is GMC. GMC has been so kind to allow me to use their 2500 Denali HD truck to make some videos for this week, and it is an incredible truck that is a towing machine. So let's talk about some of the features that come standard on this truck. The 2021 GMC Sierra 2500 comes with the world's first six-function multi-pro tailgate, offering six different positions for enhanced second-tier loading and load stop solutions. This truck offers a comprehensive suite of trailering technologies, including pro-grade trailering system and the in-vehicle app, integrating the truck's infotainment system and tons of trailer profiles and trailer statuses, It has HD surround vision and more cameras than you could know what to do with. This Denali comes standard with luxurious interior features from leather seating, which is both heated and ventilated, a multicolor heads-up display, and of course, Apple CarPlay and Android Audio. All of that being just the technology of this truck, not even including how well it tows my bass boat and is just a beast to drive. I can't thank GMC enough for letting me use this truck, and of course, I will have all the information you guys need to know about this Sierra 2500 linked in the video description. Thanks, GMC.
huge thanks to GMC for allowing me to use their absolutely sick uh, diesel 2500 to drive around and make some cool videos. I was not able to put that ad in a previous video because the fishing day was just horrible. So I thought that I would uh, kind of start this video with a sponsor segment to kind of show you guys what a sponsor ad should look like. We'll, we'll get into that later on in this video. But I had a lot of questions and I, and I may kind of pull up Instagram here and there and, and draw onto them. But I asked people what they want to know about my story. So I'm going to give you guys the uh, the high level, who is Tyler Anderson, and then we're going to dive into kind of my life story. Uh, and of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, there will be timestamps along the bottom of the play bar on the screen, and they will all be segmented by the the, uh, the type of, of topic that we're talking about. And so if you guys are not interested by something that we're currently talking about, you guys can go find something else in the video that more interests you. But I think if you guys skip ahead, you're going to miss some crucial information that sets up things we're going to talk about later. Uh, I apologize if there's, you know, ums or ands or, or pauses. I'm just not really going to do a whole lot of editing to this video unless I royally screw something up. And so this is going to be you know, basically uncut. And so the high level of, of who Tyler Anderson is, I am a fishing content creator. So I, I love creating content, whether it's photos, videos, articles, uh, audio, podcasts, music, music videos. Uh, I love creating content that people can enjoy and, and, and soak in uh, that is around the fishing industry, specifically bass fishing. I love catching bass and I love teaching people how to catch bass. And so that is my main goal on this channel of Tyler's Real Fishing is to help people understand uh, bass fishing patterns and behaviors to make themselves better bass anglers. And so that's what most of the content on my page Page, in terms of YouTube page is about, but then social media as a whole. I just love making fishing exciting, and I've been at that since February 9th of 2012. No, February 9th, 2013 is the day that I started making YouTube videos and really started my social media presence. Um, what I do is, like I said, create fishing content, but uh, I do Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook sometimes. Um, what else do we do? Uh, I, I love making disc golf content. We'll talk about that later. I love playing music. I love sports. I grew up on the water my whole life. And my main goal in life, which you, you guys who follow the channel for a long time might know this, uh, I'm a Christian. And so I believe strongly in the words of Jesus Christ and uh, that he knows what's best for us here on this earth. And so I'm going to follow him and tell people about how he's changed my life and how his love uh, and sacrifice for us on the cross took away our sins so we can live eternally for him. So my whole goal with everything I do is to lift up the name of Jesus and in every aspect I can um, lift his name above my my own. That's always my goal. I never want to be more famous than than, than Jesus is in my life. Um, I never want to, to, to get to a level where I'm afraid to share the gospel for the fear of, of losing sponsorships or relationships. So that's who I am. I love making videos and I love uh, the fact that I get to do it all for a greater purpose. And I feel like all of us out there can um, even if, even, if you're not, even if you're not a, a Christian or religious person of any kind, you can sympathize with that, is that all of us out there have some kind of greater purpose uh, in mind for this this life and not just, you know, doing something for, for material gain or, uh, I guess, I don't exactly know where I'm going with this, but I have a, a greater purpose for all of this than just YouTube. And so with, with that general thing, I'm going to talk about, like I said, the majority of this podcast is going to be talking about my YouTube journey. And a lot of you guys out there that don't know what it takes to be a YouTuber or, or, or you know, the, the history of fishing YouTubers, that kind of thing. But I have to talk first about the, the type of person that a, that a social media influencer or, or YouTuber, I'm going to kind of use those terms interchangeably, the type of personality uh, and person that those people are myself included. So don't get me the, the wrong way over these next few minutes here. I'm going to have my phone out throughout a lot of this podcast so I don't miss any notes. Um, I'm not trying to say that the, the person that I am is better than other types of people, but in order to make money from your passions as we'll talk about here later on this video, you have to be of a certain personality type, a certain work ethic to be able to make your dreams, your passions, a reality. And so one of my favorite quotes uh, or, or lyrics in a song lately is uh, John Bellion. He's a hip hop, you know, rapper, pop kind of guy. And in one of his rap segments of a song, he says, I'm a cross between hard work and Jesus anointed. And so I 
totally sympathize with that, that I believe that, that God and Jesus uh, have, have gifted me with certain passions and, and a work ethic and abilities, but the cross is that I'm a cross between hard work and that. So, of course, the anointing comes first, that, that I've been gifted in certain ways to do certain things, but it would be nowhere, nothing would come to fruition of this. I would never have at this point, 205,000 subscribers. I would never have uh, a, a career right now in the outdoor industry doing what I love if the hard work wasn't there. And so that is why I think the phrase following your passions is not going to work out for most people. Uh, doing your passions as a job takes a certain type of personality and work ethic that I just don't think many people realize it takes. Uh, I've seen a lot of YouTubers and a lot of social media people come and go because they just weren't hard working enough. They weren't dedicated enough. They weren't willing to put aside some fun in the moment uh, to sacrifice and, and do what they need to do now. And so that the reason why I'm starting this podcast may be on a downer note for a lot of you guys is that not everybody can do what I do. Uh, I, I, again, I say that not to try to discourage anybody, but I'm a realist. I love telling people what real life is like. And so doing this as a profession, uh, we're going to talk about all the facets of my job, whether it's uh, you know making videos for you guys here on the channel, the instructionals, doing freelance content for basically all my sponsors, but specifically Strike King and Lose on the Bass Pro Tour. I'll talk about that. There's lots of things that I do, and I couldn't do all of that if I was not incredibly hardworking and didn't have the exact work ethic and personality it takes to be a content creator and a, a self-employed type person. So this can really apply to if you want to start your own plumbing business or you want to start your own XYZ, uh, you know, just if you want to be a, a self-sufficient person uh, and work for yourself, this is where a lot of this information and, and tips will come into play. And so let me just look back at my notes here. Um, yeah, so understanding the type of person that I am at the core uh, will help you guys kind of understand the path that I took a little bit more, and that's why I'm starting the podcast and the video off with that. Um, so I kind of want to start with the the beginnings of my life. I'm not going to talk about like growing up or you know playing sports, but when it comes to this mentality that I talked about, I've had a work mentality for a long, long time. I grew up in a family where we just did things ourselves. It wasn't like individualistic type family, like everybody cooked dinner for themselves. I had great parents, but especially my dad, he believed in, uh, and it came from his dad and his, you know, his dad before that. He, they believe in in a good day's work and putting your hands, uh, you know, to 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 work and getting them dirty and being tired at the end of the day, so you can go to bed and wake up refreshed the next day. I'm not saying uh, that everybody can do that. I know if people, some people have different levels of energy, and I've been told, especially by my wife in the last few months of being married, that I have an unbelievable amount of energy, and so I definitely get that from my dad and from his dad. But just like my dad never hired anybody to do anything, you know, if he could uh, learn it himself, and if it was manual labor and it wasn't all that dangerous, he would do it himself. And so that was kind of instilled in me from the beginning, you know, whether it was helping him with chores around the house or, uh, you know, building, I love building Legos as a kid. I had that written down here. I just loved doing anything with my hands and not stopping until the work was done. And so, you know, growing up with the kind of mentality, I, I always knew that with hard work and dedication comes the reward at the end. And so when my parents told me that I had to get my Eagle Scout and Boy Scouts if I wanted to get my driver's license, I completed my Eagle Scout in blistering time. I think I was only in Boy Scouts for like three years, three and a half years, maybe actually maybe a little, maybe four years. And I got my Eagle Scout before I could even get my permit. Uh, maybe I was like six months late or something like that, but I made sure to get done what my parents thought and what, what at least I thought and agreed to was a, a good trade. And that was to get an Eagle Scout, uh, to have good life experience and spend time in the outdoors and get all the merit badges and such. So glad that I did it. I think the state of Boy Scouts is slightly different now than it was, you know, eight years ago. But because my parents told me I couldn't get my driver's license until I got that, I got it done. Uh, then you know, my dad said that if I ever wanted a nicer truck, my first, my first, my first vehicle being a truck, I would have to probably do some work 
just like he does, uh, to afford a nicer truck. And so for six to seven years, I did landscaping around my neighborhood. Uh, eventually my dad would, you know, c- kind of come with me and he would drop me off with the trailer, uh, with the lawnmowers and the weed eater. And he'd come back and get me after I was done before I could drive myself. And even after that, I still continued to do landscaping all around my neighborhood for tons of different clients because I knew that if I wanted something, I was going to go work for it. And I just, I don't know what it is. It has to be in your DNA. There are so many people out there that have a passion. It could be a sport. It could be an activity. It could be music. But if you don't have the work ethic to uh, take that passion and make money out of it, you're never going to make a living. I, I see the, the fallacy all the time of people that uh, it's on social media, it's kind of like a you know whimsical type thing where it's, oh, just man, just follow your dreams, dude. You know, we can all live on a penny a day. But in this country, you can't. Like, if you want to actually make a living, you got to make a living. And so I just think that a lot of people out there are not really built mentally and physically to turn their passions into a job, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, We need people to work, um, I hate to use the word normal jobs, but a a job in an office or a job building things or contracting or engineers, we need all those things to live. Not everybody can uh, make uh, their passion their job, but if you want to do that, you have to understand the personality traits that it takes. And so I think that's all I wanted to talk about from that side of things. We're going to kind of move you know, from, from growing up when I was younger and the, and the mentality there, we're going to move to the video beginnings. So most of what I do now is the video side of things. It is the freelance video. It is the YouTube video. It is, I don't know why I keep mentioning freelance first. My, my YouTube gig was always the first gig. It'll always be the first gig, uh, the first thing on my mind. But just producing videos, producing content has always been something I loved to do. Even before we ever had a bass boat, even before I really dove into fishing, I loved water sports. My family had a uh, ski nautique, an older ski nautique, we had, uh, which is a, a ski boat. We had jet skis. We had some sailboats. Nothing like really super high priced. Uh, you know, we had a, a regular lake house with like uh, an RV that you'd pull up to it, a cheap RV that was my grandparents. Um, So I'm not going to say we struggled, but it wasn't like we had super crazy big lake house and tons of boats and everything. But we just, my family loved being out there. We loved being on the water. I mean, the summer we were there like what had to be four nights a week in the summers. It was so much fun to spend time growing up on the lake and that lake being Lake Travis in Austin, Texas, where I later started the Lake Travis High School Bass Team, as we'll talk about Actually, wait, will we talk about that? Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit when it comes to tournaments versus videos and such. Um, but I, I just loved filming things. So we had camcorders. I, I was kind of the star of a, of a film that I did for my like second grade class. And I basically told the story of what all the water sports were from wakeboarding to wake surfing and wake skating and tubing and, and this funky little board that my dad Drill made out, of, made out of a piece of wood. I forgot honestly what we called it—a saucer, like a flying saucer. I just loved making videos. In terms of, I didn't actually edit them. I would film them, and you know, my parents would edit them for me. I just loved making videos and making things seem exciting. And so when I got into bass fishing, it was—I had to be—I don't know. 14, 13, 14 years old, really starting to get into it. My mom would drop me off at the pond for 20 minutes before she would drive me to school. And I would, I would try to catch as many fish as I could. I was, I was definitely, you know, bitten by the fishing bug, but I didn't really have an opportunity to fish a whole lot. Cause we still had at that point, a Malibu sunsetter, which is an early, early model of the Malibu wake setter wakeboard boat. And my dad realized that my passion for fishing was far outpacing my passion for uh, wakeboarding, wake surfing, and, and just being on the lake fishing. I could do 12 months out of the year in Texas, but you could not wakeboard at least without a wetsuit, uh, you know, for, for three or four months of the year. And so, uh, are you, you, yeah, the only time you, you, you couldn't be on the lake was four months a year. So my dad said, if he's going to make memories with me, he needs to sell the boat and buy a bass boat, which is, again, I always talk about it. My dad loves me so much, and I love him. It's amazing to have such a, a dad like that that would give up what his passion always was, which was water skiing, wakeboarding, and, and being on the lake and just hanging out. And the fact that he would sell that boat and with that money buy 
a, a, a 12 year old used bass boat with like cheap electronics and a cheap trolling motor and no power poles and no accessories uh, to go from, you know, a boat that he had, he had built up to be so cool to get a bass boat to make memories with me means so much to me. So if you have a dad out there and he's done a lot for you, pause this video and this podcast right now and give him a big thank you. And so I say all that to kind of lead up to finally got a bass boat and I don't exactly know what was the catalyst that led to this, but I eventually told my mom, like, hey, for Christmas, can I get a GoPro camera? And at that point, they were like, I don't know, 250 bucks, something like that. And so I got the GoPro Hero 3 Black. It was like the third GoPro ever made. And I just started filming random fishing stuff. And, and you can go back on my channel right now and watch my first ever video. And I actually give a tip in my first ever video. Oh, I, I wouldn't actually call it a tip. I would say I just I just said what I was using. But we launched the boat, and you see the boat kind of take off. And I uh, actually filmed the intro in my car from like an angle down here. It looks horrible. And then uh, I catch a fish on a uh, uh, bobber stopper pegged weight fluke on a dock. The hook set is all kinds of janky. And again, like I'd only been fishing for hardcore for you know two or three years at that point. And so that was the beginning of my YouTube journey. I didn't know what I wanted to film. In February 9th of 2013, when I posted that first video, I didn't even know you could make money. I didn't know you could make money on YouTube until, I believe, three years later. Maybe two, two and a half years later, but it was quite a while before I actually realized you could make any kind of money on YouTube advertisements. So, I mean, I didn't miss out on that much, as we'll talk about some of the numbers later on in this video. But I just wanted to film fun stuff. I wanted to film my friends playing soccer or playing playing golf and, and just hanging out together. We filmed stuff at, at friends' pools, and I edited together some very obnoxious, you know, electronic uh, hype videos for my friends and I's birthday parties. I just, I loved making content. And eventually I realized that the fishing videos I would make, they kind of started to get a few views, a few hundred views, a, a thousand views. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, I should, I should keep doing this. And so I, I don't exactly know which country my first you know, extra external country fan came from, I think it was Brazil. And, uh, I had someone message me. They were like, Hey man, love watching your videos. I live in Brazil. And I said, I said, Holy cow, that is pretty dang cool. And so I kind of made a decision around that time, you know, a year, a year and a half into it, that I'm going to start making a lot more videos because this is something that I didn't really think about, you know, having an audience of some kind, but you know, I, I did have an, a desire, like I said before, to make it exciting, whether it was whatever sport I was playing or activity I was doing, it could be underwater basket weaving. I want to make that look exciting for the audience watching. And I just watched the outdoor channel TV shows and and besides Bill Dance's bloopers, you know, a lot of the shows out there on cable, fishing and hunting, were just boring. And I saw the fun that I had fishing and walking the banks and marinas and catching catfish and bass. And I just thought that was so exciting. And a, a feeling that I definitely feel like you guys out there definitely feel if you love this channel is that I love, we both love making fishing exciting. And I didn't see that excitement in the fishing industry. And so I wanted to make videos that were exciting. So to my knowledge, I was one of the first people ever to put different music than, you know, country, what I call country elevator music uh, behind fishing. So I put dubstep and, you know, house music and electro and I had crazy color grades with, I mean, it'd probably give somebody with epilepsy a seizure right now watching my old videos. But it was definitely ex more exciting, at least in my mind, my young 16, 17-year-old mind when I first started than uh, most fishing shows that I was watching. And there was really not that many YouTubers out there. So when I realized I started getting a few views, I don't remember who I first contacted, whether it was Fluke Master or John B or Flair or One Rod, whatever. A lot of our early YouTubers that were early on in this game, uh, we all just kind of started becoming online friends. And I remember doing a live stream with John B and he was in his, his, uh, his, uh, his dorm at Hawking College or Hawking State, whatever he was at. And so... I've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, you, you'll hear a lot of stories throughout this podcast, but uh, I, I realized that there was a, a place for people to make fishing videos and people would watch them. Now, the scope and the numbers of people watching were not near what they are today, but that scope was there and I saw it. Uh, and I, I believe that that was divine intervention that God, you know, 
put onto my heart. This is something to put your time into because I loved soccer. I loved in high school. I loved ultimate Frisbee. I loved leading worship. I'm really active in leading worship at my church and singing and playing guitar. And so I had a lot of different things that I wanted to do. And I just decided that making fishing videos was something that was worth my time, especially when a check for $75 came in from YouTube. And it was like, what the heck? This is crazy that I can make money doing this. None of my other passions I could make money from. And so that's, again, when I said I made the decision to start making more and more videos. Um, when it cam When it comes to editing those early videos, I get a lot of questions about editing. Um, I picked up editing relatively quickly, but one thing that was very important was always spending time around video editors that knew more than I do, and that's just a, a theme in general, is that if you want to get better at something, spend time with people who are better at it than you are, and so that's how I got you know, a, a, lot, a, a lot quicker start on, on editing than a lot of people, and then of course YouTube is a wealth of information, not just, as you guys know, for fishing information, uh, but just if you want to learn how to do anything, YouTube is the place for that. Um, but there's a, 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 I guess I'm going to talk about YouTube myths here in a second. I want to talk about growth statistics. So I have all of the subscriber growth numbers and view growth numbers on my channel by uh, separated by year right here. And so a lot of people out there, first off, don't know that I've been doing this for eight years. Like I said, February 9th, 2013 was my first ever upload, or I guess maybe not my first upload, maybe when I created my channel. Uh, and so it's been over eight years when I, at the time of recording this podcast, uh, since I've made my first video on YouTube and I've learned a heck of a lot. And we're going to talk about more of that, but I was not big right away. My channel was not big right away. Uh, it didn't grow fast right away. It took a lot of work. And that goes back to the work ethic thing is that I had the passion, and, and sure, you can have a passion for something and work for 10 years at it, but if your work ethic never matches the the amount of passion you have, you're not going to get anywhere. And so luckily, and I believe I was blessed with that uh, you know, by God and by genetics, uh, that I worked hard to make my dreams a reality, even when the, the going was slow. I think I was lucky that I didn't know what the potential was. Otherwise, I might have gotten more discouraged. I think nowadays, if somebody starts a channel, they see the numbers that a lot of us bigger channels get in terms of you know, views and, uh, and, and, and engagement and subscribers, and they think that I could, they could never do that. But I think, like I said, if I had known what numbers fishing channels could get to, looking at Lunkers and Flare and Black Tip H, I think I would have been a lot more discouraged. So that was probably a nice thing for me. But in the first year of having a YouTube channel, I had 103 subscribers, and I feel like nowadays you can get 103 subscribers in one year. That that should not be very hard to do. That should be, as a matter of fact, if you make a dozen videos in your first month, one of them might pop off and get a few thousand views, and you'll probably get, if your content is good, you'll get 103 subscribers, and then my views in the first year were just under 10,000 views. Now, of course, I did not post very often in that first year, but I was uh, early to the YouTube game. Not many of us were out there. I will do a podcast at some point going over the history of YouTube anglers with tons of pictures, tons of graphics. Uh, there's been a lot of us over time and quite a few that have come and gone uh, and definitely tons that have come and stayed. Uh, the second year of my channel, I had I went from 103,000, I gained 1,800 subscribers. So I had almost 2,000 subscribers at the end of that year, which was definitely cool. I was probably maybe getting my first YouTube check in at that point, and I had gained 150,000 views in the second year. So comparatively, 10,000 views to 150,000 and 103 subscribers to almost 2,000 subscribers, definitely quite a jump between the first and the second year. So this goes to show you guys that just putting in time and effort can have crazy results uh, after a matter of years. This is not a this is not a short game, and I'm going to talk about where I see myself in, in, in 5, 10, 40 years. I've never done, I've never made any decisions in my social media videography career based on the short-term benefits. I see this as long-term. I want to provide for a family doing my passion for a living. And so based on that, I have made uh, short-term, uh, long-term decisions. So like I said, the second year was great. Third year, even better. I gained 11,600 subscribers and I gained 1 million video views. And in that fourth year in 20, I believe it was 2013, 14, 15, 16, 2016 was so far the second best year for my channel. 
Uh, it is 46,000 subscribers gained and 5.2 million video views gained. And that was purely based on YouTube fishing was blowing up. People started to fish like no, no before, no before, if that makes sense. Uh, people watched YouTube videos like they never had before. YouTube was exploding. It was a, kind of the same rise as Minecraft and, and gaming a few years before. We saw it in fishing with kids transitioning from playing video games as much to being outside and fishing. And it was just awesome to be a part of that early rise. Like I said, with Lake Fork Guy and Flair and, and, uh, and D Almighty and, and a lot of the guys that have been at it for a long, long time. Uh, but then we kind of petered off as I got to college, which we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about why I didn't drop out of college, all that jazz. Um, I gained 35,000 subscribers the next year in 6.6 million views, so more views. The sixth year, I gained just 23,000 subscribers in 3.7 million views. The seventh year, I gained 23,000, so just about the same with almost the exact same amount of views. You know, I kind of petered out in 20. Uh, 2019, yeah, 2019, and then in 2020, had an amazing year, a lot of you guys are recent subscribers, based on 2020, I had 49,000 subscribers, and based on how much more a view pays on YouTube now than it did in 2016, with 4.5 million views, I've made more, I made more money in 2020, YouTube-wise, than I ever had before, and really cemented this as a career for myself. And so that's kind of the, the YouTube growth numbers, and it just goes to show there is curves, but there also is flat times in YouTube. And, and just, I mean, probably any job in general, maybe if you're like climbing the corporate ladder, it's kind of more of a stair-step thing. But when you're doing this for a living, the YouTube social media thing, uh, you have to be okay with having crazy fast times and crazy slow times, and even down times, even times when your your views go down and it doesn't make any sense. You have to understand that uh, it's not YouTube's fault. Oftentimes it's your content's fault, and oftentimes it's just that the audience is not there, and so you have to adapt and create different types of content. So uh, we're going to talk about the different types of content that I've made, and of course we're going to get into sponsors and all that stuff here in a second, but I do want to go over a few YouTube myths to kind of get these out of the way, and before I do that, I'm going to take a drink because I'm getting parched right now. So like I was talking about a second ago, we're going to go over some YouTube myths. And sorry, there's like a hair in my face, and I don't know where it came from. Uh, all right, so the first YouTube myth is that you make a ton of money from YouTube. People ask me all the time, you know, are you making a living for yourself? Are you doing good? Um, you know, is, 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 is becoming a YouTuber a viable career path? And of course it is. It is still not too late to make a living from YouTube, but for the vast majority of people out there, even the vast majority of small creators, excuse me, that you guys watch, it's just not a reality that they're making a ton of money, even even making a living on YouTube alone. You have to be a smart uh, entrepreneur per se, if that's the right term to use, a uh, smart social, social media entrepreneur to actually make a living. You have to diversify your income streams and make money from a lot of different places, whether it's affiliate codes and sponsors paying you money and, of course, the YouTube ads themselves and merchandise. You've got to have a lot of different things going for you until you get like really big on YouTube. I'm talking like, you know, really active audience with like 500,000 subscribers, you can't really make a full-time, especially family-supporting living on YouTube. So that's myth number one. Uh, myth number two, a lot of views equals a lot of subscribers. So when you have a bunch of videos blow up, it equals subscribers. Doesn't always. Uh, sometimes the, the videos that blow up can lead to subscribers, but doesn't always mean those subscribers are going to then watch again. So what I ran into at some point in my videos is that my underwater videos, which a lot of people subscribed to or subscribed from, I don't do that many underwater videos because I kind of ran out of topics. I can't do that many underwater videos. And so the people that subscribed for that content don't get that anymore. And so oftentimes they won't unsubscribe. They just won't watch the content anymore. So also, like I said, tons of subscribers does not always mean tons of views. A really good ratio on YouTube, if you can get 10% of your audience to actively watch your videos, you're doing really well. You look at any fishing YouTuber out there, almost all of them are sitting at like a 5 to 20% ratio. So if you have a million subscribers, that means you're getting 50,000 to 200,000 
views on every single video. I right now in whatever time it is, June of 2021, I'm sitting at like seven to 15%, which in my mind is pretty dang good for instructional content. If you were to go back on a video a year ago, it's probably sitting more in the 15 to 25% ratio, which is definitely good. I will, I will take that ratio, uh, but that's another myth that I wanted to dispel. Third one being having a lot of subscribers and, and followers on Instagram or TikTok, whatever you want to say, will get you good compensating sponsors. So whether that's compensation with gear or compensation with experiences or compensation as we all want to make money, uh, having a lot of followers does not always equal uh, getting good uh, compensating sponsors. And then the last myth is getting started is hard. That is totally a myth. That is not true. Anybody can make a YouTube channel. Anybody can build an audience. You just have to find a niche that hasn't been explored and or burst your way onto a niche that has been explored and just do it better and more efficiently than everyone else. So like I said a second ago, we're going to talk about my, my video style. YouTube has changed a lot. Their algorithm has changed a lot, and thus the type of, of content that is that is viral and, and, and trending, that is always changing. So I'm kind of thinking back to my first videos. They were a mixture of adventure and instructional. I definitely taught a few things. I'm not going to say I knew a whole lot, but I, I taught what I knew, and I look back then, and I'm like, you know what? That stuff actually still applies. Um, I wasn't just speaking smoke out of my, of, out of my butt. But uh, I could kind of make whatever content I wanted, and it worked. After that, let's say when Lunkers got into the game and, and, and Casey Neistat was really exploding YouTube, the vlogs became necessary. So in 2016, end of 2015, all the way through, I mean, even, even till now, but especially 15, 16, 17, you had to be vlogging everything. So I vlogged in a car and getting gas and getting gas station snacks and even if I caught zero fish, I would still film all day and make a video about it because people wanted to see your daily life. But at one point, just like with anything out there, I'm t I, don't, I don't care if you're talking about competition with your uh, snow cone business or you're talking about uh, you know social media videos on YouTube, saturation exists. And so the market became too saturated with YouTubers, YouTubers that made vlog content. And so when I was in college, I made some college vlogs. They were really successful for me, and I got a lot of subscribers from those. And then, of course, much like I talked about with the underwater videos, if I make a fishing video, somebody who subscribed for the college vlog stuff is not going to watch much, if, if at all, of the fishing content. Um, and so where I was trying to go with that was that your, my content has changed so much over the years. And so when it got to the point of you know getting to the end of college, I thought, you know, I, I've, I've had a fun time, I've traveled, I've met a lot of people, but I just, I'm not having the crazy success that I used to. You know, when vlogging was blowing up, like I said, 2016, I gained 46,000 subscribers. It was a really dang good year for that type of content. But every year after that, even until 2019, the views and subscribers, while it was great to get 23,000 in one year, that was just not what I wanted. I wanted faster growth. I wanted to make more money. I wanted to have a, a more successful platform. And I just, I wasn't getting that with what I was doing. So I made the decision in I'm trying to think exactly what it was. I graduated college in May of 2019. I think January of 2020 is really when I made the switch to just doing instructional content. I mean, if I had a tournament come up, of course, I would film tournament bass fishing content, but I wanted to just make content that had a shelf life over a long time that could continue to get views. That's what the word shelf life means. It's, it's like a, a pantry item that you stick on the shelf. It can last for a long, long time. I wanted to make videos that could do that. I kind of looked at the channels like Tactical Bassin, uh, D Almighty, Wired to Fish, you know, both in and out of fishing. I looked at channels that weren't just crazy clickbait titles. They actually had good metadata to them. They had good analytics to them, and they continued to get views for those channels over time. And so that's what I did is I, I made the decision in 2020 to make in solely instructional content. And like I said, I had my, my best year ever in terms of, of subscribers gained and money and influence gained. Uh, so that was definitely a, a successful thing that I did. And I think I'm doing it best. Just personally, I think that when it comes to a one-man show, 
you know, I have an editor, his name's Levi, he edits some of my stuff, but when it comes to, you know, YouTube channels out there that are creating instructional content, it's just me, I'm getting all these video ideas besides the ones y'all give me, I'm putting them together, I'm writing the scripts, I have to go out and catch the fish, and I do it all with great cameras and great video angles and great editing and graphics, and I just don't think there's many other channels out there that are doing exactly what I'm doing, and so that's why I'm so glad that you guys are on board for this because it's just so much fun to teach you guys how to catch bass from an exciting standpoint and an instructional all tying it together with great high quality video. And so when it comes to um, that high quality video, like I said, I'm going to stick with instructionals for a long time. It's worked out really well. And that's the the branding that I want to build. Um, When it comes to the high quality video, I love just making videos. Like I said, I started with, with just making videos with my friends and family, and I love making them good. And I believe that I have, again, like I said, you know, cross between hard work and Jesus anointed. I believe that I've been, been given an ability to tell stories very well. I love speaking to you guys. I love talking. And I, I try to say this with humility, but I believe that I'm one of the best storytellers in the outdoor industry. And so when it comes to creating a video, there's more than just slapping clips together on a timeline. There is figuring out, especially when you're filming, how to film for the edit. When I'm filming something, I'm thinking about, all right, if I use this kind of music, I can put these things together, and I'm going to use this exact transition between these clips. And I just learned from a, a, a young age in terms of my content career, young age of my career, that uh, that I loved using a lens and using audio to tell stories. And so I wanted to do that on a grander scale. I wanted to produce you know, maybe my own TV show one day or have just highly produced content. And so I got some sponsors behind me, which we'll talk about sponsors here at the end. Uh, I got sponsors behind me to uh, give me some money to go on a trip to Minnesota to catch some bass and produce some awesome videos. So we had Luz and PowerPole and a bunch of other companies uh, fund this trip called Monsters of Minnesota. I had two camera guys, Perry and Taylor, two of my good friends from college that filmed for me here and there, and they flew up to Minnesota in Canada, and we shot one heck of a series, especially having never done it before. Uh, we really had no clue what we were doing. Of course, I knew how to catch fish, but we still had some tough days, and we were able to make a really cool series that is still live on my YouTube channel and is on a platform as well called Waypoint TV, which you guys can find on your, your Roku and, and you know Fire TV and such. And so... From that one series, you know, spending 20 to 30 hours editing each one of those episodes, I realized that there was a, a, a need out there in the fishing industry to tell stories really, really well. Like I said, the TV, uh, you know, traditional media was still not doing it for me. They were still not telling a story. I wasn't captivated by it. And so I thought for a long time, how am I going to... You know, of course, of course, as always, make money for myself because that's the goal. The goal is always to, to make money. Whoever tells you that you don't need to make money to pursue your passions and make a job out of it, like I said, it's a bunch of baloney because it's not about the money to me, but you have to make money to make your dreams into a job. And so I, I thought, you know, what's a, what's a good way to make money but also satisfy that desire in me to, to, to produce videos and make videos? And so I said, I'm going to do freelance videography. I'm going to try to reach out to companies in the industry that maybe I'm already sponsored by on the YouTube side of things, so they pay me to talk about their products. But maybe... Those companies also need videography for their product releases or for their TV shows or whatever companies need content for. I know that video is the future and and definitely will be, and it was then a few years ago when I made this decision. Uh, Video is the future of marketing. And so if there's companies in the outdoor space that know who I am or not, uh, they can see my my content, my storytelling abilities, and there will be people out there that can, can pay me to do content for them that uh, that lifts their brand to, to higher levels, makes their brand look even better, and of course helps me establish a name for myself in the industry and make a living. And so I worked with PowerPole to make some content. I've worked with, uh, of course, like I said, Skeeter Boats to make some content, now working with Yamaha. But one big one is that I wanted to work for uh, one of the biggest sponsors that I have, which is Strike King and Lose. And my reasoning for wanting to work freelance, which means, you know, 
pitching a, an idea to a company for a video project. They pay me for the project and I produce it. That's what freelance means. Um, I'm not really under like contracts usually uh, to make this kind of content. It's just, you know, word of, word, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A hand, handshake type deal is just like, hey, make this thing. Sounds great. We'll pay you this much. Um, and so I wanted to work more officially with one of the biggest sponsors I had, which is Strike King and Lose. And I love the tournament scene. I think, you know, I think I could have talked about tournament fishing. I did start a high school tournament, you know, team at my high school, loved it, fished in, in college, did the whole tournament scene. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to circle around back to that. I was going to skip it, but I'll circle back. Um, and I loved, I loved the tournament scene, loved the Bassmasters and, and watching Major League Fishing on TV. And so I wanted to be on tour with those guys traveling the country and filming everything they do. You know, filming their behind the scenes, kind of like Brandon Palinick has, uh, set the standard for, for any kind of show out there covering or series covering a professional angler. I wanted to do that with the Strike King and Lose Pros. And so they said, deal. So we signed, a, a, a at least for, for my current life stage, it was a big monetary deal. They were compensating me very well. And I produced a series called Monsters, uh, not Monsters of Minnesota. I produced a series called Kings of Bass for Strike King and Lose covering Greg Hackney, Kevin Van Dam, Andy Montgomery, Mark Rose, and Jeff Sprague. Due to coronavirus, we only filmed three episodes in season one, but it was super successful. I loved flexing my storytelling and videography abilities and, of course, editing abilities in post-production to one of the companies that already believed in me as a person on the YouTube side and believed in what I do there. And so working for them on the freelance side not only allowed me to make more money and more of a living for myself, but also it enmeshed me into that company culture even more. And so if there was ever any turbulence within that company, it would be so hard for any of these brands that I work for to let me go because I provide something of value to them. I provide videography, I provide YouTube, I provide influence, and of course, product sales and brand recognition. And so that is why I do the freelance video thing. Same thing is going on with Skeeter and Yamaha right now. They believe in who I am and what I do, and so they want me to film content for them. Yamaha specifically calling it Yamaha Boating Academy, and Skeeter calling it something that I can't disclose to you guys quite yet, but uh, we're going to be making videos for Skeeter as well. And it's just, like I said, super beneficial to me uh, in, my, in my current life stage to do both things, to do the YouTube and do the freelance, even though the YouTube might suffer a little bit when the freelance work picks up. So like I, two days or I guess one day after this video drops, I'm driving to Tennessee to continue to film social media content for Strike King and Lose. Kings of Bass got taken from me, my baby, but they took my baby and they are now doing it in-house. So that series is still going. It's still awesome, but I'm not producing it anymore. So they wanted me to go on tour still with the Bass Pro Tour guys, film every Strike King and Lose Pro, not just those five, and do tons of social media content for them. So if you guys go on the Strike King or Lose Facebook and Instagram pages all throughout the Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour stages, you will see all the content that I make and host on those pages. But that is kind of my, my goal for freelance. I don't exactly know where it's going. I don't know if I'll be doing more freelance or less freelance, but I'll be doing freelance, and I love it. So I see my camera battery is about to die, or we're going to switch that battery and keep this thing rolling. So the next thing I want to talk about is going to be the topic of sponsorships. And I've actually already talked about this topic uh, pretty in-depth in episode two, I believe it was, of the On Deck podcast. I talked about all the sponsors I have currently and what I do for them, uh, and of course what they do for me, not like total, you know, open bookness of, uh, of how they compensate me. But I have, uh, I have talked about the sponsorship side of things. And I've also made a really good in-depth video. If you want to learn how to get sponsors and what sponsors are looking for, I made a very good video about that a few years ago on YouTube. If you just search Tyler's Real Fishing Sponsors, you will find that video. And I highly recommend that video, especially if you're not satisfied with exactly how I describe it here. But when it comes to getting a sponsor, I don't talk, I don't care if you're talking about Ridge Wallets, here on the channel or, you know, a VPN sponsor that a lot of the YouTubers you watch use or a fishing industry sponsor. Uh, sponsors want to see a value. They want to get some kind of return on their investment. If they're going to give you 20% off their baits, they want to see some kind of return on that 20% they are giving off of their product they're selling. They're losing money, and so they have to get some kind of investment return on the thing they are investing in. And so if a company is going to pay, like all my sponsors pay me 
actual cash because you know I have a certain size influence. If they're going to pay me cash money out of their pocket, they have to get a return of some form on that investment. So for me, one way that I always showed my value was by showing, of course, my numbers, my engagement, but of course, I also had the freelance videography thing, and I had, in, in my opinion, one of the best um, reputations of channels out there. I didn't believe in burning bridges. I don't believe in being uh, enemies with anybody or, or, or uh, being upset with anybody or uh, you know tr saying anything bad about people on, on online or even in person. That's just not who I am, and so I could go to companies and, and they could see that in conversations with me that I'm a real person and I want to treat them best and I of course in return I want them to treat me just as well and so you have to provide some kind of value to those companies now when I went to my first iCast which is a a big fishing industry event every sponsor and pro angler and and youtuber at least nowadays and and uh you know product buyer and literally a magazine writer, everybody for the fishing industry is at iCast. It is a huge event that happens in Orlando every single summer. And Lucky Tackle Box back in the day brought a lot of us YouTubers back when I was with Lucky Tackle Box, uh, which I'm not anymore. They brought a lot of us down there. The owner was Rick Patry, who actually owns Monster Bass now. Really, really smart, uh, incredibly kind guy. Still love Rick. He, uh, he brought us down there and had us all wear the same shirt, the, the same Lucky Tackle Box shirt, and we walked around to companies with cameras. That was right in the midst of the vlogging, the vlogging days, and the fishing industry was just shocked at who the heck all these kids were that were walking around with cameras. Uh, they weren't pro anglers. We weren't TV people, so what the heck are we doing? Well, eventually, wind, you know, it caught wind that we were YouTubers, and we had uh, platforms, and we, we could sell product better than pros could. And companies said, no, 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 TV shows, pro anglers, that's, that's what our budget's always gone to. And for the first, like, two to three years, nobody believed that YouTubers and social media influencers had any kind of, 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 of power in the industry to sell product or, or get brand recognition out there. And so it was hard at the beginning to convince companies of a value. When they have no clue who you are, they have no clue what you do, it's really difficult to, to create value. You almost have to like, not, not fabricate it all, but like you have to really explain to them everything about what you do and hope that they understand what that value is and how it can uh, impact their company. And so luckily, Lose was one of those companies from, from the start that truly believed in, 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 in what I do as a, as a YouTuber and a social media person. Of course, all the, the Mystery Tackle Box, Lucky Tackle Box, Monster Bass, all those brands from the beginning believed in, in social media influencers. Um, it took boat companies, motor companies, and big tackle brands a long, long time, and some of them are still not around to the fact that influencers have so much power, I believe more power than TV and pro anglers and, and live coverage combined. I think social media influencers are the way to go when it comes to the fishing industry. And it hurts me when I see fishing industry people spending crazy budgets on TV and, and commercial budgets for, for, for TV that are just, they're not going anywhere. And so, sorry for that rant aside, you have to provide value for the sponsors and the, and the companies that you go to. And that's kind of where I'm going to leave it for, for this you know, podcast. I talked about it in depth, like I mentioned in episode two of the On Deck podcast and on my YouTube channel. Don't really want to go into it a whole lot more, but I do want to transition from this into where I see myself going. You know, I feel I feel like I've answered most of the questions on here, and so I want to talk about w you know what I'm going to be doing in the future and. Will I be doing exactly what I'm doing now? Will I have the same exact ratio of freelance videography to YouTube content creation and, and photography and you know sprinkling in a few wedding films here and there? I don't know. Will I be filming more? Will I be fishing more tournaments in the future? You know, I love the college tournament scene. Filming that was so much fun. Traveling around the country with my best college friends and making fun tournament you know experience videos. That was awesome. Will I try to fish professionally? Who knows? I might. Like I mentioned before, I love disc golf and I love I love worship leading and I love being in ministry. So will I be uh, working overseas doing ministry somewhere? Who knows? Uh, I just know, like as we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, the type of person that I am leads my passions. Um, it leads to my passions being a successful career. I believe that I can make a career out of whatever passion I have because I have the right personality for that. Uh, and so as you know, time changes, 
passions may change, and the amount of time I decide to dedicate to certain passions will also change. And so, like I said, I may be an influencer in 40 years. I may be a worship leader in 40 years. I may be uh, doing X, Y, Z. I could go on for a long time about different passions I have. I could be doing online marketing. I could be selling courses. I could be teaching photography at a college. I just, I love doing so many different things. I'm just going to follow what's best for my family, what's best for myself in terms of making a career, uh, what's best for you guys. If you guys are, are, are involved, you know, if it's YouTube stuff, I want to make what content y'all enjoy. But then, while all of that is somewhat unknown, I do know that I'm going to keep working hard to provide for my family, have the most fun doing it that I possibly can, and do all of this for the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. That is what I want my legacy to be. I want people to see me not as a as an influencer that, that made a few videos, left his mark per se on the social media space, which... By the way, marks don't last very long. It's almost like uh, it's almost like chalk on a chalkboard, and then you take a, a wet rag and wipe it down. Uh, in nowadays culture, you know, you you don't last very long. People forget about you know, even big audiences. Folks forget about them relatively quickly. So I want my mark to not be about social media, to not be about making really good videos. I want all of that to tie together to lift up the name of Jesus above my own, because I believe that following Him is is what we are meant to do here on this earth. And so, uh, man, with that said, I think we are done with this episode. That is my story. That is where I am at now. I'm going to scroll through Instagram real quick just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Talked about sponsors, um, connections in the fishing industry. I guess I didn't talk about necessarily how to get the sponsors. I do talk about that in my in my other podcast. Networking is huge. So going to the iCast, going to the Classic, um, going to local tackle shops and talking to, you know, you know, reps for these companies that are selling these products, just getting your face out there is the best way. And like I said, it takes a long time. You can't expect to do this overnight. You can't expect to make any of your passions into a job overnight. It takes a dang long time. I've had a few questions as I scroll here on my Q&A of why I did not drop out of college. I actually talked about that in a video. If you search Tyler's Real Fishing, like, drop out college on YouTube or something, you'll, you'll find that exact video. I just love the college experience and I was making enough money that I could pay for it and not take out too many student loans. Um, almost done paying those off, you know, maybe three or $4,000 left of student loans. And so to me, it was worth it to get a college degree because like I said, I'm doing all of this for the long term. Would it have been smart if I had dropped out of college or uh, I say business smart, maybe not life smart. It would have been business smart to drop out Freshman year of college, when I was getting 46,000 subscribers that year, I was making, you know, okay money on YouTube, not like, you know, support myself, but Flair dropped out of college, Parrick dropped out of college, John B dropped out of college, uh, Lake Fork guy quit his job as a rep and he was just making YouTube videos, Fluke Master was making a good living on YouTube, and so I looked at all my friends in the industry and I, I, I saw success, and so it would have been smart, business-wise, to drop out of college. But that would have been immediate in my in my experience. Maybe I would have had the same influence I do now. I would have had the same rep- or the same connections I have now. But I just don't believe that's the case. I believe um, that I followed exactly the path that God had laid out for me, and and I needed that college experience to build my character. Uh, without college, I never would have found my wife. Uh, and so I, I really think having an experience like Texas A&M where I went to school and getting, like I said, the character building and the, and the faith foundation building that I had in college has set me up leaps and bounds better for uh, a good life than dropping out of college and, and making more quick money ever would have been. So that is what my answer is to why I didn't drop out of college. I just thought it was it was worth it. And now I have a college degree that if any of this ever doesn't pan out, it'll be, it should be at least in theory, easier for me to get a job somewhere. But but that will probably never end up being a passion of mine to work a job with a college degree. But it, it's, in my experience, it's I was already halfway through college by the time I could really make a living on YouTube. So I thought, I'm already partway into it. I might as well finish that job. And so I just, I, I want to take, you know, every opportunity I can to just make sure that this is a career for me. This isn't just a get rich quick scheme. This is not making clickbait type videos that sure, they might go viral. So catching fish on a Barbie rod in the middle of Walmart, that might get me get me more immediate views. I might see a, a sudden spike in money and, and, and maybe a little bit more fame or clout, whatever you want to call it, in that moment. But I want to have a career from this. 
So that is why I've decided to make instructional content and to continue to make freelance video for my sponsors and continue to do all the things that I've done to provide value to them because the more I do that, the more d dependent per se they become on me as an influencer and uh, a freelance employee. And so not only can I be helpful to them, they can be helpful to me as I provide for my family. I've always seen this from a long-term thing. That's why I'm not quick to jump to a rod company that can give me my, my own rod lineup right away. Lou's just is not in the position right now to give YouTubers a rod lineup. Maybe in the next few years they will. But I know that if I want a long career being with the sponsors I have right now and representing them and doing the things that I'm doing, I think are setting myself up very well for a career. But of course, I would be nowhere if it wasn't for you guys. If, if, you, came, if you came out of this podcast right now thinking that I'm ungrateful in some way or, or you know callous, I'm, I'm a realist. I love telling you guys how it works, how life works, but I know that I would not be anywhere without you guys watching the videos. So again, thank you so much. It is a pleasure for me to sit here and uh, be able to, to talk to you guys. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you guys so much. And if you're watching, I I love you guys. You're awesome. My my, my, my fan base and audience is just the the uh, the best thing going for me right now. And the 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 lifeblood behind the TRF brand is you guys. You know, you can have an active audience and no hard work. And that can kind of carry you a little bit. But when you have an audience like you guys who are supporting the brand and what we're doing, and then the personality, like I mentioned, to start this this podcast, uh, that you need to be a successful social entrepreneur, and you put those two together, I think we are just now uh, starting that exponential rise uh, in this industry. And I'm excited to have you guys along the road with me. So again, if you guys are not subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button. If you are still watching, uh, you guys will not be able to see any other video versions, like I mentioned, of these podcasts, unless you, you click that join button next to my YouTube channel. My throat is getting hoarse. I need to get more water, and this video is definitely dang long enough. But uh, get ready for more instructional content coming soon. This summer is going to have a lot of videos. I mean, I, I was used to doing three videos a week, and I had to kind of drop down to two. We moved to Dallas here. I'm in a, our new house here in Dallas for a few months. After that, I have no clue where we're moving. Could be Dallas, could be East Texas, could be Alabama. Who knows? Like, there's any, we could go anywhere with Hannah's job. And so, uh, bear with me as there might be little lulls of, of, of low videos, you know, not many videos coming out. But I have so many ideas and some awesome content coming, especially throughout the rest of this year for you guys. I'm excited to be here with you and teach you guys how to become better bass anglers as I better myself as a bass angler. We'll see you guys next time here on TRF and especially here on deck. <laughs>